And today's talk is going to be from uh, Steve Lavas at uh, University, or I'm sorry, at Colorado State University. And he is going to be talking about some of the security work that they're doing there. So I'll turn it over to you, Steve. Thanks very much. Um, thanks for tuning in, everybody. Um, so a lot of what has been consuming our security and operational teams over the last months is this notion of controlled unclassified information. And it really spurred us to think about doing things differently and uh, upping our game. So I wanted to talk a um, little bit about where we started, a little bit about the problem and thoughts and procedures we used to get to a design and then uh, give an overview with some lines and boxes. Uh, about how we actually put the thing together, how it works, and uh, some follow-up issues of cost and lessons. So with that, I will jump right in. So we have had a, an on-campus data center. Most of our important central services are still located on-premises, uh, some of them hardware, some of them virtual. We do have some cloud applications, our learning management system, uh, Canvas is in the cloud, but, but a lot of our important stuff is running centrally, um, while a lot of the client areas, including some of the college infrastructure, is highly distributed around campus. Um, since CUI is specifically, at least for now, uh, research information from the feds, uh, that's a focus of protection, but we don't have a dedicated advanced research computing group where such a project would naturally live. So it fell to central IT and specifically to my security team. Uh, there is a fair, a fair amount of this federal research, even though contracts are the only one, the only um, instruments currently specifying CUI, um, even that it's tens of millions of dollars. So there's some motivation to get this right. Um, and yet we have had no funding stream for things like this or like the science, science DMZ to support research computing, even though we tried to get one built. So that was where we started when confronting the notion that, you know, we really appear to have to do this. So um, it was going to have immediate impact on on our existing contracts and the ability to get more contracts. Um, and it became clear that individual project teams wouldn't be able to pull this off on their own. So it needed to be some, some sort of central provisioned uh, service and, and layout. And since it fell to me, I saw an opportunity to explore a common design that would be good for maybe some things other than just 800-171 compliance. So I talked about uh, uh, some of the challenges. Um, we lacked some of the tools that we were going to need to uh, achieve compliance with 800-171. We um, certainly were underfunded in security in general, and I mentioned the uh, sort of disconnect between the research need and funding the security pieces. And of course, there was the decision about to cloud or not to cloud. Uh, in a nutshell, uh, I started down the road of thinking about putting all of this into the cloud and then heard from some people who tried who wished they hadn't. So I was empowered to move forward on the notion of building this locally. So just some quick definitions so we are all on the same page. As a former philosophy major, I, I tend to define my terms in advance when I can. Um, so architecture, framework, and topology. Um, An architecture is a people process technology sort of thing. It's something that you put in place that covers all of those, specifies a complex system. Uh, framework is a particular set of rules that will fit into an architecture, uh, and the rules differ depending on what's being protected. Some of them are mandatory. For instance, if you have credit cards, you are required to use the PCI DSS framework. Uh, others are best practice, um, useful for auditors, helpful for customers and getting business partners, all that. So architecture um, 
is the large scale of what you build and framework is guidance on what to do with it, how to run it. And topology is the more specific arrangement of pieces. Um, usually it's more in the technology and implied process. Um, you don't as often talk about topology in terms of HR and uh, background checks and things like that. It's more about the uh, moving moving boxes and lines around on a page that can show how your system is designed. So with that understanding of those terms, what we're trying to build is a topology. And my thought here, my goal as I was working through this notion is to build a general topology that would be useful for much more than just protecting CUI because frankly, I don't have the, um, the authority or the budget to build a whole new security topology and tweak architectures and, and investigate new frameworks every time a new uh, requirement comes down the pike. I would never get it done. Not very efficient. So a general topology covers new requirements, new compliance schemes. Um, and yes, those require a lot of work uh, each time they pop up, but if we can um, have a structure, a generalized topology that will accommodate various needs, um, I think we'll be, we'll be better off. So late one night at a security conference, I dreamt up an acronym that invoked my past as a D&D player. So apologies for the, for the geeky reference there. So some core design principles uh, going into this project. Of course, the principle of least privilege, which underlies everything that we do. Uh, the zero trust model, which is a, a more recent theoretical implementation of that principle of least privilege, um, specifying strong authentication for everything on the network, devices and users, um, not caring where a packet comes from because we don't trust it no matter what it is. Therefore, your presence on a particular subnet or VLAN makes no difference. Um, it makes a difference if you have authenticated and you're come from an, coming from an authenticated device, a verified known device. Uh, and then we carefully craft need-based access. And then finally, uh, of course, in a limited resource environment, even if a major marketing push of Colorado State University weren't sustainability, the green university, um, still, we would want to uh, practice sustainable design, allowing for growth and expansion, um, building a, a funding model that's viable for the long term, and hopefully not overburdening the user so that social sustainability continues and people continue to think that we're on, at least if not their side, at least not against them too much. So, um, a core notion in this design uh, was something that came out of the Open PCI Scoping Toolkit, uh, the payment card industry data security standard um, is a bit of a bear if you haven't seen it before and have to start from scratch and figure out, oh my gosh, how do I enforce all of these rules? A few years ago, uh, a number of people came together and published this open source approach that um, talks about how you scope these rules and um, in combination with proper segmentation on the network, you can apply all of the rules to a certain subset of your network and using a risk-based approach, identify what other pieces of the network are in scope but might not be appropriate for every single one of the controls. And so I took that and ran with it and further generalized that approach a little bit. Um, those of you who are familiar with this toolkit will recognize the, the levels and the general approach. So I'm, I'm grateful to the people who went before. Uh, the basic notion is a three-tiered design. You have your sensitive stuff. In the case of PCI, that's credit card numbers. Uh, in the case of, of CUI, uh, NIST 800-171, that's, that's the personally identifiable information or um, 
defense kind of information, defense technology, whatever leads to the designation of a data set as CUI, not quite classified, but still you need to protect it. Uh, in tier two are the various security devices and services that things in tier one will consume and management devices that will reach in to tier one as well as approved user access. Those people who are approved to actually reach in, touch, mangle, manage, um, even export in some cases the data from tier one. And then finally tier three, which is everybody else. Um, the most important point is that everybody else has no access whatsoever into tier one. Uh, however, we want to be efficient with our buying of hardware. So reasonably speaking, the folks in tier one will often consume services in tier two. So tier two might be your campus DNS server. Both tier one and tier three need it. So you need to define a reasonable approach such that not just anybody in tier three would end up accidentally having access into your sensitive core. Um, this approach maps well to a zero trust model design and um, hopefully will help guide our decisions for applying controls across multiple frameworks. So a little more specifically looking at what would be in scope and I'll have some pretty colorful graphics a little bit later, but um, your tier one, that's your storing, processing, and transmitting of your covered data and the devices that directly interact without any sort of um, any sort of protection with the devices in tier one. So your um, vulnerability management scanners on the very same VLAN that don't cross a firewall um, have direct access into your storage, perhaps. Uh, the networking gear, same kind of deal. Those are subject to the full set of controls in whatever scheme you're you're dealing with. Tier two, you can think of broken up into a, a set of slices. Those are all your services, your management, your direct access. Um, the highest level is your security service providers, your firewalls and authentication servers. You want to throw all of your controls at those two. Um, they're about as risky as tier one because if they fail, tier one is wide open. Moving downward from there, from the most um, full set of controls to the somewhat least. Uh, next in line 2B is uh, those things that have direct access into T1. So can directly reach in and map a, a storage um, device or otherwise munge the data. Uh, 2C would be the services that the tier one devices reach out and consume. So your DNS and your um, NTP and, and those sorts of things. And then finally, 2D, still in the tier two, which is the risk-based set of controls. Um, but 2D would be maybe your remote um, desktops, wherever they might be in the world, in a Starbucks, in India, wherever it might be. But if they're interacting through some sort of a gateway, that's the key. Um, the, the risk of having them reach in is mitigated by um, high levels of authentication, known devices, um, encryption, indirection. So they're logging into some sort of a, a remote desktop session or VDI or, or other thing that they're not touching tier one directly. And then finally, tier three is everybody else. So everybody else, that doesn't mean you don't apply any security controls at all, but it's basic public health stuff. It's, are you running a firewall? Are you running antivirus? Um, because probably the bulk of your tier 2D users of this system otherwise would resolve in, in tier three and there are people all around them. So you wanna make sure that a, a virus doesn't spread broadly easily. And this note at the bottom is important. I'm designing an on-campus, on-premises, um, topology here, but this three-tiered approach doesn't imply location. 
So as I mentioned, the, the tier 2D folks could be at a coffee shop wherever they happen to be coming from, wherever they happen to be attending a conference. Uh, even tier 1 could be elsewhere. So this design is going to support the notion that we can't necessarily afford to put all of our eggs in our data center basket. Um, if somebody comes along with a need for more um, intense processing or bigger storage than we have room for, they might put that in another campus data center. They might put it in Amazon or Azure somewhere, and we can we can figure out how to make that work. So some tier one could be elsewhere, it could be cloud. All right, so here's a pretty multicolored picture of what I've just been saying. So just quickly to review, the full set of controls would be applied to everything in tier one, everything that directly touches the sensitive data in its storage and processing and other direct interaction, um, as well as the security services that make all of the rest of this work. Uh, the rest of the orange, the rest of tier two is risk-based, um, going to the more gentle set of controls as you get farther from direct interaction, basically, and then out, out to the tier three with no access. What seems to be just a little aside at the bottom is one of the most important things to remember. All of tier one and tier two are in scope for regulations, meaning that any device that interacts with tier one data, potentially, somehow, in either direction, is in scope for these regulations. It's just that maybe not all of the controls are needed as you get to the tier 2C and 2D. So it's a, it's a sorting problem based on access, based on risk. Um, it doesn't get you out of all of the work of doing this. It just, I think, makes it a little more uh, defendable and consistent. So we started putting this together at CSU. I had been presenting these ideas for a while before we actually had any hardware. Um, so we wanted to make our, our shared environment um, as much as possible in our existing tools as much as possible do the heavy lifting. We didn't want to um, follow the lead of some of our colleagues around the country who spent millions of dollars up front on building an environment. We just could not um, find the money to do that. And so we thought, okay, let's, let's use as much of what we have as we can, carve out compliant areas in shared infrastructure uh, where it's possible, and then add the add security tools as needed. So we started by considering what it would be like and what it would take to make our, uh, what we call our campus cloud or our central IT cloud um, compliant for 800.171. What we needed was a virtual firewall to separate um, separate the covered devices from the non-covered devices. So the tier twos from the tier threes, even on the same, um, the same VMware hosts. So uh, we talked with NSX a lot about the wisdom of that approach and scoping our, our purchase to make that happen and chose only one of our clusters um, to make it a little more economical. And that's where all of our compliant hosts are gonna live. And then we combined that with our existing uh, security topology centered around an SRX firewall cluster, um, the Pulse Secure as our remote access technology. Um, we're in the middle of a full campus rollout of Duo for multi-factor authentication. We have uh, Elastic Elk um, parsing our logs and um, using that for uh, keeping track of what's going on in the environment. We we have a Dell Compellent storage array that our infrastructure team was happy with, and uh, we just decided that was a great uh, argument for simply buying another one, but with encrypting drive. So we're using the same fiber channel architecture in the back end, the same management personnel who are good at their jobs and, and do this well, um, so we didn't have to, to reinvent the wheel. Uh, we did have to add some additional security tools to fill in the gaps. Uh, the biggest one so far that we have added is a subscription 
for a, a subset of our university, only, only about 500 IPs of Tenable.io, which is the cloud-based evolution of Tenable's um, continuous vulnerability management um, and Nessus manager. So that gives, gives us a lot better and ongoing tracking of vulnerabilities and remediations and, and follow-ups for incidents. And so this just kind of highlights the, the things that we um, either had to buy new or expand uh, to flesh out the list of, of available tools. I've mentioned, I think, all of those except for near the bottom of the left column. Of course, there are additional physical access control and video monitoring sorts of questions when you're looking at a shared data center and bringing it up to uh, 800-171 standards. So adding some more physical access control to the devices in the racks and making sure that only the right people can get in there and nobody can inadvertently or intentionally remove hard drives and video monitoring of the area as well. So that's just some, some physical infrastructure enhancements that need to, needed to happen. Normally I would pause for questions, but um, uh, we're just gonna keep going here and uh, hopefully we can get some questions at the end. So this is that same familiar diagram, but with our, our CSU technologies now plugged into them. Uh, shouldn't be any surprise that the, the researcher desktops are near the right hand end, the, uh, the common services next up, followed by tier 2B, which is the, the things that can reach into the highly controlled environment to do management and access um, and vulnerability management, risk tracking. And then tier two, the, the security tier, um, keeping all of this running properly and sorted out and segmented. And then finally, the, um, the important eggs in the green basket on the left. So in much fancier terms, um, and this is where I would normally have a bunch of hands go up and have a deep conversation. Uh, so I will spend a little bit extra time here talking about some justifications for how um, these things work. Uh, if anybody wants to break in for questions, I'd be happy to do that too. Um, the user experience starts with the researcher or the user at a desktop or laptop somewhere in the world, somewhere in tier three, connecting directly to our SSL-based VPN, um, where two-factor authentication is enforced. And all of that happens on a dedicated uh, security zone on our firewall, actually two of them, one for remote access, one for authentication. Uh, note that that's a duo proxy. And so the idea is to have a device on campus that we can tightly lock down and reconfigure in the event that the duo web service becomes unavailable. Uh, we have something to to fall back on and, and fix that if it's a crisis. And then below the firewall, you have the, the general services area. Um, notice the, the two-tone fade on the mixed tiers two and three for VMware. That's making the point very strongly that this is the this is the secret sauce that makes this entire thing possible other than just the controlled remote access. The fact that we have uh, VMware NSX providing virtual security between individual VMs, uh, effectively inserting a, a firewall at the, the virtual wire level as a device gets created in a particular uh, zone or group. So that um, the College of Engineering's public web server can live on the same blade in the same IP space with um, a VM into which a researcher will uh, RDP through the gateway to get to some federally covered data. And that wasn't possible before we added NSX to the mix. So that's the, um, that's the critical piece of functionality here. Um, 
Notice that dedicated processing is in a dotted box at the bottom. We have not yet added that. So when a user logs in um, to one of these VMs, the notion is um, this is a, an early proof of concept where the kind of processing they would need to do would be such that it could be handled by a normal VM. So it would be running Excel spreadsheets or um, installations of SPSS maybe, or things that aren't going to require uh, so many resources that we're into the world of high performance computing. That said, we understand that probably we will have to get there. And there's ongoing conversation about how that next step will, will go, whether we will add more uh, dedicated processing resources in the data center, whether we'll use some sort of secure tunnel to get to um, external HPC resources. Um, we have a, a cooperative agreement with the University of Colorado just down the highway um, where we have a, um, a powerful computer and our researchers have access to that. Currently it's not, uh, but we haven't decided that that's going to be a, a covered or compliant resource. So we're still looking at that possibility for the future. But for this first pass, um, the processing will be done on the VMs as well as the, the access. So they'll, they'll have a, a device mapped in VMware to um, one of the covered data storage areas. And they'll just do all their work there. They probably at some point will have to take data out of that interface. So some possibilities exist. Uh, one possibility is wash the sensitive data and pull the, pull the cleaned data out to give to your, your research assistants or share with your partners. But if you've got to actually access and move the covered data, then we'll, uh, we'll let the firewall approve certain SSH or HTTPS connections to, to agreed upon uh, portals and, and such. And uh, the only other thing I wanna highlight on this document is that that bottom tier that's a little bit unattached from tenable.io on the left to the Nessus scanners on the right, that's the notion that there are physical boxes on this subnet that would be scanning things directly. So that's a tier one kind of a thing. And those things are managed by a cloud service. So we just make sure that um, the path is known and there's no inappropriate access there. Um, so that's a little bit out of the user path, but we, we, we control the path there as well. So, so the sort of summary of what I've talked about so far, we wanted to do a, a core topology of on-premises gear and processes in the existing data center that we had already paid for, that's already well-managed, well-protected, physically access controlled, redundant power, cooling, alarms, video monitoring, all that stuff. Um, we wanted to add security to our virtualization technology so that we could share that platform instead of buying redundancy. We want to do existing, leverage our existing authentication, authorization, and accounting. And the notion that um, we wanted to build small storage to begin with. It's, it's kind of hard to know how big that's going to get, but we started somewhere. We've got about 100 terabytes of usable to get started with, and we'll, we'll expand as we need from there. Um, we wanted to allow for the addition of other sites. I mentioned the remote HPC possibility. And then finally looping back all the way to the beginning, we want to anticipate the adoption of other frameworks, other compliance needs. Uh, for instance, there's rumblings that uh, CUI will also apply to student financial aid. And while that's not set in stone and it's causing some consternation about how on earth we're gonna do that, this would be the framework into which 
or rather the, the topology into which we would accommodate that, that additional framework or additional implications of that framework, I guess. Uh, similarly, when, when our existing PCI hardware topology ages out and needs to be replaced, it may well be that some of it can be incorporated here instead, build another zone on the firewall, um, additional VMs protected by NSX, um, and just plop, plop those workloads here and not have to refresh technology and thereby also simplifying our network, which is better for everybody. So when we get to the end, what will we have gained? I would say that we have increased the campus-wide motivation to move high assurance systems into our, our data center. So I mentioned our highly distributed IT infrastructure. Uh, other departments, colleges have small data centers scattered around campus. Um, I happen to believe that probably money would be better spent uh, putting those systems into a place where we've paid a lot of attention on power utilization and backup and cooling and uh, security. And so hopefully this would, uh, would help goose that process a little bit. Um, raising all boats. So I want to improve security for all central systems, not just for those that are currently under the umbrella of CUI. And I think that by solving this in the data center, generally, we have the possibility of doing that. Um, you know, the mythical ability to keep compete for extra grants and contracts that we don't currently get when they re require higher security. In theory, that could pay for itself pretty quickly, so long as we work out the, well, you know, the money's coming in for a research grant. Are we allowed to buy these sorts of things or pay for these sorts of services. And then finally, um, we have highly functional and capable operational groups across central IT, but they don't always um, have the knowledge or experience with the more advanced security technologies. And this is a way to inject that into their, um, their environment to help with their staff development, help grow the capabilities of their team, and and frankly get their help in pulling off this this broad kind of a design. I'm not going to go into extreme detail on costs. Uh, I did mention that some of the gold standard designs that we were looking at that that got early compliance with 800-171 were talking in the multi millions of dollars to pull that off and everyone here just rolled their eyes and said yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm not gonna do that. Uh, so this so far has cost about 175k up front. That's for the encrypting storage array, uh, some of the licensing for NSX and Tenable.io. Um, we have some pieces that will be ongoing that uh, are still in the process of figuring out a, an ongoing funding model. We have not yet hired an additional FTE to keep track of all this. Um, and we have not yet added a backup and, and document sharing capability for this project. Uh, that's, on the one hand, it was delayed to, to get the funding to get it launched. On the other hand, it was delayed for evaluating use cases and, and user preferences on how to pull that off, whether it's some sort of uh, public cloud-based, um, backup and sharing product or something we already have in Office 365 or an on-campus. So that conversation is underway. And then ongoing funding for growth and replacement of hardware. And uh, I keep going back to sufficient high performance processing. And if we have to add that locally, of course, that'll, that'll be a, a substantial cost. Hopefully we can find opportunities for partnership and uh, shared access uh, for compliant processing. So before I stop talking and take any questions, um, I wanted to review a few lessons. This design sprung out of one person's head um, and 
Um, of course, when that happens, uh, you have to be careful that everyone understands what you're talking about. So first of all, our storage vendor seemed to be a little bit unfamiliar with what we were asking for. So we asked for a storage array with encrypting drives. And once we got past the hump of how they would build that in their product, they gave us a quote and forgot to spec a hardware security module as which it turned out had to be used uh, for their solution to work. And so there was an extra cost there. So finding somebody at the vendor that really understands uh, what you're trying to achieve uh, sure is helpful. And every time a new, uh, a new framework comes out into the world, that's a challenge because they are playing catch up just like we are. Engaging operational areas early and often, of course, um, that almost goes without saying, but uh, even when what you are doing won't have much of an impact, you think on some of the operational areas, it's nice to have other people check your logic and be sure of that just to keep from being surprised when they're asked by, by leadership. So what are you doing for this, this CUI project? Anticipating scope with a new framework. So not only do the vendors need to play catch up to help you, um, it's, it's hard to anticipate how much storage, how much capacity, how much throughput you're gonna need when you don't really even know what your list of covered projects is going to look like and how much data they're going to use each because that question hasn't fully been asked before. So that's a, that's where a lot of the FTE is going to be spent, frankly, is dealing one-on-one -on -one with researchers, getting to learn about all of the projects that they're doing and wrapping that into making sure that we continue to have adequate resources for them. And then finally, uh, unless you are already an expert at the many acronyms, federal laws, state rules around research funding, um, make friends with somebody who is, um, and it'll, save you a lot of headache. So that's the end of the prepared material and I'd be happy to, to answer questions. All right, well, thank you so much for, for going over all that, Steve. Uh, it looks like we already have two that came in, so I'll read them out to you. Okay. Um, first question is from Rick. Uh, wondering what the division of firewall labor, in quotes, is between the SRX and the NSX and why? That's a great question. Um, VMware would love to have NSX be your entire organizational firewall. That would imply that everything you run is on a VM. Uh, realistically, I don't know any organizations for which that transition has been completed and there's always hardware in your, in your infrastructure until you finally abandon the notion of buying iron. Um, so our hardware firewall is doing all the things that a hardware firewall has always done, uh, multiple security zones, uh, parsing traffic between them, doing IDP, um, looking at tuning our, our flows and, and in concert with the, uh, the Pulse gateway, hoping to implement some user-based access control as well. The NSX firewall, um, with that understanding is going to treat most systems as upstream. So from the NSX perspective, our entire campus is the internet. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll create a different role perhaps for RIP space just to sort out predicted traffic. But, but realistically, um, everything upstream is gonna be taken care of by the, the hardware firewall, at least for the, for the time being until our balance of hardware systems and virtual systems changes. Uh, so really the heavy lifting in the, in the NSX firewall is going to be um, what you might call east-west traffic, uh, traffic between VMs from one VM to another VM, filtering out the fact that the engineering web server has no business uh, trying to talk to anything in the CUI environment uh, and vice versa, frankly. You don't want anything accidentally leaking onto a public website. So that's the level at which the NSX is going to be working mostly. 
Okay. Uh, second question was from Brian. Uh, why did you select encrypting drives instead of VMware encrypted virtual machines? Uh, also a great question. Um, and there are probably m multiple levels of answer. One is that um, that's an unfamiliar technology for our operational group and for our networking team, which to date hasn't had a lot of um, interaction with the virtual networking inside VMware. And so the more you rely on internal black magic in VMware, the, the less comfortable people are in adopting it. Um, it seems to be more conceptually defendable and um, easier to communicate to have a storage thing that is encrypted. Now, as we move forward, as we consider expansion, um, economies of scale may well uh, move us in the other direction, and that's a, and that's a great thing to, to keep track of. Thanks for the question. All right, uh, if anybody else has questions, please type them in. Uh, I have a couple that I jotted down. So, of course, this is just, you know, proof of concept right now. And you said that you're thinking about this, but sort of what are your thoughts about how you would expand this to other things that are sort of outside of, of this scope? You know, if, for lack of a better term, how would you peer this with other secure environments? Sure. So, um, in terms of bridging from here to, say, another, another data center for storage, um, there are certain physical security pieces that would have to be mandated at that other data center, access control, video monitoring, all those kinds of things. And then either um, a direct fiber between devices or uh, an IPsec VPN between sites um, or uh, asking them to install another uh, VMware instance over there and doing their um, layer two spanning across layer three. There are a variety of ways to to do that. Um, peering with an external institution, I mentioned the the HPC resource down at the University of Colorado. That would probably be some sort of a, a VPN based approach, although a dedicated link, whether that's um, uh, some sort of layer three uh, tagging solution or some other kind of approach um, where we would maybe transfer using a service like Globus uh, is also something that, that we would want to think about. Okay. Uh, Brian has another question. Are the hosts dedicated to sensitive virtual machines or do they also run tier three virtual machines? Does the meltdown vulnerability change that? Hmm. So the, the VMware structure infrastructure uh, is running both uh, tier one and tier three. And so yes, uh, meltdown is a concern. And, um, you know, frankly, this entire environment um, is managed through a set of connections that's fairly heavily, heavily restricted. And we're just going to have to uh, keep an eye on the evolution of that vulnerability and um, make sure that to the best of our ability that that, uh, that gap doesn't get, uh, doesn't get jumped. Of course, those vulnerabilities came out in the middle of this design implementation. So yeah, that was no fun. Okay, I have a, another one and it's, it's more of a user related question. Mm -hmm. What sort of additional training do you have to provide for the ultimate end users of this? And I guess that has sort of two parts. Number one, how do you instruct them how to use it properly? And, and number two, how do you watch to make sure that they're not using it improperly? Right, so um, I don't know if all of the listeners would be um, at universities, but um, when you realize that the bulk of the users will be professors, <laughs> you, uh, you have a lot of um, gentle handholding and uh, collaboration 
to do here. Many of them would be accustomed to buying a server and either sticking it under their desk or slapping it in the comm closet down the hall and to be told that they now have to not only house it in some central IT owned system across campus, but log in through a, a VPN with two-factor authentication just to get to their data um, takes a little bit of schmoozing and understanding of the new federal mandates and risk and and all of that. So it's a it's really uh, it's a combination of cross campus communication of new technologies just like any other new technology as well as engaging with um, research support uh, committees and and then ultimately meeting face to face with each researcher on campus that's going to be participating so it's it's labor intensive um, and in terms of of enforcing these uh, these policies and procedures some of these 8171 requirements are going to be the responsibility of the uh, the PI on a project. The researcher will have to take personal responsibility for some of the things. Uh, we can't absolutely lock down every possible avenue uh, for them to remove data from a covered environment. And, and realistically, this is not classified data. This is merely the data that's in between classified and public and so the risk um, is less while still present. So you can educate uh, the users to do things like um, only use secure channels for communication and make sure that um, your firewall is always on. Combined with what um, what system management tools we we have. Um, Microsoft SCCM comes to mind. Uh, but again, that varies across departments, across the university, and some of these users will be remote and not reachable by some of those control tools. So it's it's really a um, some user responsibility as well as user education. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question from Jeff. If a particular control comes out for another framework, do you apply that control to all of tier one, or do you carve out tier one controls based on frameworks, uh, i.e. PCI DSS versus CUI? Great question, thanks. Um, I had omitted that from the presentation because I feared getting too complicated and running out of time, but since we're not out of time, uh, yes, it may well be that there will be multiple tier one zones in effect. Um, if, the, if the two frameworks are sufficiently different and it would be onerous to apply uh, an 800-171 control to a PCI environment, then it might well make sense to have two separate tier, tier one areas that have no access to one another and control, uh, control access to each of them differently through NSX and through um, Pulse Secure. All right, thank you. Well, we'll pause here and put out a final call for questions if anybody has them. Uh, thanks again for doing this. Um, if you can make sure to send me your slides as well, I'll make sure that those get posted so that people can download this after. I sure will, thanks. I, I appreciate the opportunity to uh, to talk about this and. Um, would welcome any follow-up questions or ideas. Yep, and here we do. We have one more. Uh, okay. So Brian says, uh, what do you use for monitoring and event management? So um, we use mostly a, a variety of, of tweaked open source, um, Cacti, Zabbix um, for security and, and vulnerability monitoring. We use Nessus active and passive scanners. Um, it, it will depend on what the desktop, uh, what the, the researcher's VM is, whether it's Windows or, or Linux that they spin up, um, what access tools we prefer and have, um, have the ability to monitor with. So if somebody spins up a Windows 10 VM to do their 
access and basic processing, then we would uh, we would certainly enroll that for SCCM and do system monitoring and patching there. Uh, probably more the Zabbix side of the house and a few other uh, open source Linux monitoring tools um, that our infrastructure team runs to keep track of that. Okay. And another from Jeff, can you elaborate on your risk assessment and security assessment processes for CUI? Well, uh, how much time do we have? <laughs> so um, without uh, telegraphing too much of our, our risk assessment process, um, we tend not to be deeply engaged in overly formal risk analysis on every kind of system. So you can intuit what that means. Uh, but risk assessment as, as we're practicing it here is, is wrapped into the process by which we um, hear about a, a new uh, research project, bounce that through the, our sponsored programs department, and then into the face-to-face -face meetings about what this is going to entail, what kind of information is going to be stored, what does the contract say about what you have to do, um, how does that map to our available resources, do we need to go explore some additional capabilities, and that gives us a, a beginning idea of what the potential risk is, is going to be. Because frankly, um, while 800-171 is a, is a single document, the, um, the projects that end up in this environment are going to be radically different in terms of amount of data, importance of data, um, and the, um, and what happens if something is inadvertently released when it when it shouldn't be? Um, so we are on campus right now, going through some exercises, uh, codifying some of our risk management and business continuity practices, and rolling out some some new tools. Uh, but I don't have a lot of um, fancy standards and lingo to to give you right now. All right, uh, CJ has a question. Are you looking into leveraging cloud storage like Box or OneDrive? Are there issues in the way that keeps you from using cloud storage? Absolutely. Um, I mentioned that we were considering what to do about backup and sharing between members of collaborating teams. Certainly we've looked at Box and Dropbox and, and we have, we're a, a well, we are both an Office 365 and a Google Apps school, although we're shifting our students away from Google. Um, so we have lots of OneDrive out there. Um, OneDrive and I believe Google Apps have had some issues with um, limitations on file size that were a concern for some of the data sets that might want to be backed up. Um, and so we were looking at Dropbox, which um, could accommodate the much larger files because its its normal mode of behavior is writing in chunks rather than writing entire files. Um, although Dropbox was lagging behind in, in gaining federal uh, certifications, so we were kind of waiting to see how that played out, um, knowing that we'd be rolling out the proof of concept earlier than we might need extensive backup capabilities for, for huge data sets. So we're, we're evaluating the various cloud possibilities and uh, I would imagine we'd, we'd be deciding in, uh, in future months to, uh, to go one way or another. All right. I think that we may be at the end here. So I'll thank you again, Steve. Um, for those that are still listening, the talk next week will be uh, about uh, uh, the CC STAR program and how it uh, impacted Northern New Mexico College. 
and we'll make sure that we get uh, these slides and the recording posted. So thanks to everybody and have a good weekend. Thank you very much.